بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم guys um, so you guys asked me to come and talk about like Islam and Christianity kind of compare and contrast them um, so I kind of did that uh, I got this kind of presentation here with them side by side and we're going to talk about different topics and how they kind of view those two topics so the first one is God what's the concept of God um, for Muslims we believe God is absolutely one and singular um, for Christianity they have one God but they believe the mainstream Christianity believes God is the Trinity of three divine persons these three divine persons are three distinct persons but still they believe that is still one God somehow um, so for Muslims we believe God is transcendent um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not mixed into the creation, right? Um, and he's also not like the creation at all. For Christianity, they have, there are three persons, God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they do believe that the Son person of the Trinity did come into the creation and incarnate as Jesus, uh, peace be upon him. Um, for Muslims though, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent, we do believe he's intimate with us in his knowledge of us, in his being responsive to us. So even though he's out, you know, not mixed into the creation, he still hears us, responds to us, answers our dua, um, knows us very well, knows us better than we know ourselves, right? Um, both of us agree that God is loving and merciful and just. Um, both of us agree that God is all-powerful, um, all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-hearing. So, I have some ayat. Uh, kind of talking about though the concept of God. So the first one is Surah Al-Ma'idah, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is correcting the Christian concept. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who say Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary, they have certainly fallen into disbelief. So this is something Allah says, this is Kufr. Okay? And he says that the Messiah himself taught, he said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. And whoever associates others with Allah in worship, they will surely be forbidden from paradise by Allah. And their home will be the fire, and the wrongdoers will have no helpers. So Allah is very strict about shirk, right? And so he's saying, if you think that the Messiah is God, he's saying that Jesus is God, this is kufr. And kufr, we know it leads to hellfire. This is shirk, it leads to hellfire. Um, from the Bible, the Bible actually, you have a verse in the Bible that agrees with, where the Quran is saying. Um, in the book of Mark, which is a narration of Jesus' life story, um, it says in there that one of the scribes from the Jews came near, and he heard the people argue with one another. And so he saw that Jesus was answering everybody really well. So he said, O oh, teacher, which commandment is the first of all? Which one is foremost? Which is most important? And Jesus said, the first is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and with all your strength. And so, even in their book, uh, they're getting the same message there, actually, when they quote Jesus. I think the problem comes is when they talk about Jesus, other people talk about Jesus in their book, they exonerate him and make him equal to God, or make him, you know, some kind of subordinate, but still on the same level. Um, also, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about in in the Quran correcting them to correcting the Trinity idea. So Allah says, "O people of the book, do not go to extremes regarding your faith. Say nothing about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus the Son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah, and he was the fulfillment of His word through Mary and the Spirit created by a command from Him. So believe in Allah and His messengers, and do not say Trinity. Stop it. It's for your own good." Allah is only one God, glory be to him. He is far above having a son, and to him belongs whatever is in the heavens, whatever is on the earth, and Allah is sufficient as a trustee of affairs. Um, the Bible also agrees with this kind of concept. In the book of Isaiah, which is from the Jewish section of the Bible, uh, they have a prophet named Isaiah. We don't know if Isaiah is actually a prophet or not. He's not mentioned in the Quran, but it's, that doesn't necessarily mean he's not. It's just we don't have any proof from our side. But in the book of Isaiah, he says, Declare and present your case. Take counsel together. Who told this from long ago? Who declared it of old? Wasn't it I, the Lord? There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is no one beside me. 
And so you have that emphasis on Tawheed. Even in the Bible, it agrees with us that God is absolutely one. Um, second topic is what do we view, how do we view Jesus between the two religions? Okay. Um, in Islam, we believe that Isa is a prophet and messenger of Allah. We believe he's the Messiah. Uh, we believe he was born miraculously, but he's created in a miraculous way. Right? He doesn't have a dad, so he's created in the womb of Mary by a single command. Allah SWT says, Kun, and he is. Right? He says, Be, and he is. Uh, we also believe that Isa did a lot of miracles. He cured blind people, he cured leprosy, he resuscitated dead people, even some miracles that aren't in the Bible, like he made a clay bird and blew on it and it became a live bird. That's not in the Bible. Although there are books that were not included in the Bible that have that story too. There's something called the Immensity Gospel of Thomas where he does that miracle in that book, but they didn't include it in the Bible when they decided what was going to be Bible or not. Um, one of the biggest differences is we don't believe Isa was killed or crucified. Um, that is a core tenet of Christianity, that he died for everybody's sins. And Islam teaches that he was not killed, was not crucified, Allah saved him from that. Um, we do agree with him they don't have a second coming, but we believe he'll come back to do his messianic kingdom. Um, they believe he's going to come back and do judgment day uh, on some level. So for Christianity, they believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. So God took on a human form. Um, they believe he's also the son of God. Um, they also believe he's a prophet, or some of them. Uh, they just say that in their Bible that he is a prophet. Um, they believe he's the Messiah. That's what Christ actually means. So if you guys hear that word Christ, that's Greek for uh, Messiah. Um, he was born miraculously for, for them also, but they believe he was begotten. So he's like eternally generated from the Father's God source. Um, and he's just putting that into a human kind of shell. Um, they believe he did many miracles also. Um, they believe he was crucified to atone for everybody's sins. So his crucif crucifixion is paying the price that they say everybody was supposed to die for their sins. So he died so everybody else doesn't have to die for their sins. But, you know, one question is we all still die. So I don't know, you know, maybe they mean die like they'll be in hellfire or something. But a lot of them. Um, they also believe after he was crucified, he resurrected after two days. So he was crucified on Good Friday, and then he resurrects on Easter Sunday. Um, after he resurrected, they have different narrations about how long he stayed. He went and visited some of his disciples, and then they say he was taken up. He ascended. Um, they also believe he'll have a second coming to come, but he'll come and judge the world, they believe. Um, Allah subhanahu wa gives corrections for them in the Quran, too, about their idea about Jesus. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, he says, Indeed, the example of Jesus in the sight of Allah is just like that of Adam. He created Adam from dust. He said to him, be and he was. So Allah is saying that just like Adam was made miraculously, Jesus also was created miraculously. And if you think about it, Adam is even more impressive because Adam is coming as a full-grown adult with no parents whatsoever. While Jesus is born as a baby, he has to grow up and learn and develop. So he's even less of a miraculous creation than Adam, alayhi But nobody worships Adam, right? Um, in the Quran also, in Surah Maryam, Allah says that Jesus declared, I am truly a servant of Allah. He has destined me to be given the scripture and to be a prophet. Also in Surah Al-Imran, he says, remember when the angels proclaimed, O Mary, Allah gives you good news of a word from him. His name will be the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. He'll be honored in this world and in the hereafter, and he'll be one of those nearest to Allah, right, in relationship. In the book of Acts, this is a book about the disciples of Jesus and the people that came after him in the early beginnings of Christianity. One of the disciples, Peter, he says to the Jews, he announces to the Jews, he says, fellow Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power and signs that God did through him among you as you yourselves know. So he's telling them what Jesus is. But what is he saying? He's, he's, saying, right. he's a man that's doing miracles because God gave him, you know, gave him these miracles to prove himself to you. Right? But he's not saying, he's not saying this is God, not even saying this is the Son of God, anything like that. Right? This is something that is developing you know, over time. Um, 
for salvation, okay? So salvation is how do you make it out of the hellfire? How do you make it into Jannah? How do you make it to paradise, right? For Muslims, we would say you have to believe in one God. You have to worship Allah alone, nothing else. Uh, basically, you do the shahada. You have to have that shahada, right? La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That has to be there for you, okay? Um, you have to worship Allah alone how the Prophet ﷺ taught us to worship Allah, right? You can't just do whatever you want. You have to worship him how the messenger from God shows us how God wants to be worshipped. Okay. Um, so you obey Allah's commands, and then when you mess up, you repent. You do these things, you go to Jannah. Okay. For Christianity, they say you have to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, and you have to believe that Jesus died for your sins, and you have to at some level believe in the Trinity, and then you have to repent when you sin. Okay. But that's their formula for salvation. Now, isn't there a repentance still? Don't they have like the confession chain? So, yeah, they're different branches. So, Catholics do go to confession as part of their repentance. So, they go with a priest, and it's kind of semi anonymous. They go in these booths, and then they tell the priest whatever sins they've done. The priest gives them some penance, like some thing to do. Like, he'll say, Go say 40 Hail Mary prayers, or go say 40 Our Fathers, or whatever number he gives them. And then they go and do that, and then they feel that their sins are cleared for the time being. And then they come back every couple weeks or whenever they felt like, you know, some guilt or something has built up. I don't know if Orthodox do that, too. I think they might. Uh, Protestants don't do that. I, I was raised as a Protestant, so we never, they say, that's between you and God. You don't need to go and confess to a priest. Um, Allah tells about salvation in the Quran in multiple places. Um, one is in Surah Al-Imran, he says, remember what Allah said? Oh Jesus, I will take you and raise you up to myself. I will deliver you from those who disbelieve and elevate your followers above, above the disbelievers until the day of judgment. Then to me you will all return and I will settle all your disputes. So here Allah is telling us that he saved Isa, right? He didn't let them kill Jesus. He took him up. Also in Surah An-Nisa, this is the most clear, like the clearest uh, showing that he didn't die for everybody's sins. Allah says, and for the Jews boasting that we killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, that they neither killed him nor crucified him, it was only made to appear that way. So even those who argue for this crucifixion are actually in doubt. And they have no knowledge whatsoever, and they're only making assumptions, and they certainly did not kill him. Right? So Allah makes it very clear. Uh, he wasn't killed and crucified. Okay. Um, as far as salvation to Allah mentions sort of the Ghafir, he says, whoever does an evil deed will only be paid back with its equivalent. Okay. And whoever does good, if they're male or female and they're a believer, they will enter paradise. Okay. So you got to do the good deeds, but you got to have that belief there too. Okay. And he says, there they'll be provided without any limit. Um, and then Allah mentions that sort of Miriam, you know, it's not ironic here. Uh, he says, as for those who repent, believe and do good, it is they who will be admitted into paradise, never being denied any reward. Um, a similar thing, you have this in the Old Testament, right? In the book of Ezekiel. This is another prophet. We don't know, possibly, possibly not. He's not mentioned in the Quran. But in his book, it says, God is saying, Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, according to your behavior. And, and he says, Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin or destruction. Right? Go into hell. So often, very often, their book agrees with us, right? The only time their book doesn't agree with us is also when the book doesn't agree with itself, right? So, um, the next thing is, how do they view Revelation, okay? Why? How do, what, is, what is that like for us? So, in Islam, we have the Quran. We say, this is the speech of Allah, right? Allah taught it to Jibril, alayhi salam. Jibril came and recited it to the Prophet, sallam. The Prophet, sallam, taught it to his companions. They wrote it down. Okay, so this is verbatim the speech of Allah, okay? Also, we have a hadith, which are collections of narrations of what the Prophet ﷺ said, what he did, and how he reacted to things that happened in front of him. And these all have chains of verification, otherwise we don't accept them. They have to have a chain of narrators, when we know the narrators, and we can verify. For Christianity, they follow the Bible. What the Bible is, is a huge library of depending on what kind of branch they are, they either have 66 books in it or they have 73 books in it. Or the Ethiopians, they had even, I think, maybe three more books. They might even be 79, I think. Anyway. Okay. Um, so it's a collection of Jewish writings. It's the Old Testament. 
and Christian writings, which is the New Testament. Okay? These are written over a long period of time. For the Old Testament, over several hundred years. And then for the New Testament, within about a hundred or so years. All those are written by different authors. Okay? Um, specifically, the New Testament, which is the Christian section, they have four Gospels, which are biographies of Jesus' life. They have the book of Acts, which is a history of the disciples of Jesus and early Christianity. Then they have a lot of letters to churches. Okay? So some people wrote letters to churches to tell them how to be good Christians. Um, they have letters by Paul, which is the majority of them, like 13 of the letters. There's 27 books. 13 of them are Paul's letters. Uh, then they have letters from John, from Peter, from James, and from Jude. And then finally they have a book called Revelation, which is... Somebody had a dream about the judgment day, and so he wrote down what he saw in that vision. But this guy is not a prophet. It's a guy named John, and he was probably from uh, Turkey, around that area. Um, it's kind of unknown. A lot of their authors, they don't, they don't write their name on it, other than Paul. Uh, they don't really write their name on their stuff. Just later, people thought, it sounds like it's this guy. So they put names attached to it. Um, but they believe these are all written by humans, but they're, they believe they're inspired by God by the Holy Spirit person of the God comes down and inspires them and makes them write stuff. And so if they see errors or contradictions, they say, that's because they're humans. But if they see anything good, they say, well, the Holy Spirit guided them to write what is good. So it's a very different kind of uh, concept of what revelation, what's acceptable. Like for Muslims, would we accept this? Not really, yeah. We need some verification. We need to know who the authors are. We need to know you know, something more than just what the content is, right? So we're pretty strict, which is a good thing. Um, so in Surah Al-Imran, Allah talks about revelation. He says that he's revealed to you, O Prophet Muhammad, the book in truth. It confirms or verifies what came before it. And just like he revealed the Torah and the gospel from before. Um, also in Surah Al-Ma'idah, it says, we've revealed to you, O Prophet, this book with the truth as a confirmation of the previous scriptures and a supreme authority over them. Okay. So the Quran, basically, Allah tells us, it tells you what is correct and what's wrong from what they have left. Okay. Whatever they have in their big collection, the Quran will tell you what's right and what's not. Okay. Um, so Allah says, so judge between them by what Allah has revealed. Right? you got to go off of what Allah has revealed. And do not follow their desires over the truth that has come to you. And to each of you, we have ordained a code of life, and if Allah had willed, he would have made you one community. Uh, but his will is to test you what he's given each of you, so compete with one another in doing good. To Allah, you will all return, and he will inform you about the truth about, about your differences, regarding your differences. Okay? Um, here's where Allah talks about how they had kind of lost their revelations. Because okay? Allah does say he revealed books that they're talking about, but this is kind of Allah's telling you how they kind of lost it. And the sort of the book of Allah says, do you believers still expect them to be true with you? Even though a group of them would hear the word of Allah knowingly and then corrupt it after they understood it. So he's talking about some of the people. Specifically here, he's talking about some of the Jews would do that. They would hear, they know what it's supposed to say, and then they would put their own spin on it when they're writing it down. And Allah says also in, in sort of the book of Allah, he says, woe to those who distort the scripture with their own hands. And then they say, this is from Allah, trying to get some kind of a gain. So woe to them for what their hands have written, and woe to them for what they have wrote. And so they write the book themselves, and they say, oh, this is from God. No. And so Allah's kind of warning them, woe is, like, really, it's a threat, right? So um, Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, he says, Remember, O Prophet, when Allah took the covenant of those who were given the scripture to make it known to the people and not to hide it. But they cast it behind their backs, and they traded it for a fleeting gain. What a miserable prophet. And they even, in their book, they have some of their prophets criticizing them. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 8, he says, How can you all say that we are wise and the Torah of the Lord is with us, when in fact the false pen of the scribes have made it into a lie? And he says, The wise shall be put to shame, they shall be dismayed and taken, since they have rejected the word of the Lord. So Jeremiah is basically agreeing with sort of the Muslim here. Where Allah Lord was telling that they used to write their own stuff and they would distort it, and then they said, Yeah, this is the same, it's from Allah. Right? Okay, um, we talk about this for some of the there are 
what are the groups? Okay, because they every every religion naturally because you have humans, humans like to break up, we like to fight with each other. So you always get some groupings. Right? For Islam though, it's really amazing. We've had a majority staying all together. Like we have about 87% of Muslims are all Sunni. No other religion has that level of maintenance of their main group, right? Um, you have the Shia, the Shia are broken into three main groups and then they have subgroups too. So you have the Twelvers, which is what, like Imami were out of uh, Iran. Uh, you have the Seveners, Ismailis, and then you have the Zaydis. The Zaydis are the closest to the Sunnis. They're not that much different. They just kind of argue with us about Sahaba uh, on some level. And then they have some little different of theology. Um, Ideas. And then you have Ibadis are in Oman. Um, they grew out of the Khawarij group. Um, they also do some kind of uh, uh, philosophical theology stuff, but um, practice-wise, they're similar to us. Like they do Salah, they fast Ramadan, they do Zakat, all those things are you know there. But we might argue with them about some of the sifat of Allah and that kind of stuff. Um, for Christianity, you have some major groups. You have the Catholics or the majority. Uh, this came out of Rome. They're the ones that have the Pope that's in Rome. They're the ones that do the confession that you, you mentioned. Um, another group is the Orthodox. They're usually Russian, Greek, or Ethiopian Orthodox. Um, the church split around the year 1072, I think. They split over who has the most authority. So the Roman Catholics said the Pope does, and they said no, different bishops are equal, and they can share the authority, and they had a fight like a political divide. Um, they're kind of the same, although their priests can get married. Their priests grow beards. Uh, you know, so they're a little, not as, not, they're a little bit different than the, the Roman there. And then Protestant is what you get mostly in where we live in the United States. Um, Protestants are a big, wide range of groups. Uh, they broke away from the Catholics in the 1400s, or actually 1500s, Martin Luther, 1500s, I think. You might remember Protestant Reformation, like 1500s. They broke away, and then once they broke away, they started breaking up into lots of different groups. Um, so you have Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Evangelical, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Anglican, Church of Christ. They have more and more and more. These are just the biggest, the biggest groups. Um, like I was raised Methodist. That was the one I was raised in. Mostly Kansas. You're going to see a lot of Baptist, Methodist, maybe some Lutherans across the street from us, right? Yeah, so. Um, so a lot reminds us about groups. He says, from those, and he's talking about uh, the Christians too, and it's sort of the mind that he says, from those who say we are Christians, we took their covenant that they neglected a portion of what they've been commanded to uphold. And so we let hostility and enmity rise between them until the day of judgment, and soon Allah will inform them of all they've done. Um, so Christianity kind of, since the beginning, has been a lot of breaking up and fighting and arguing and not able to agree. And Allah says it's, that's something that he put on them because of them abandoning what they're supposed to do. Right? That's why they've always had a lot of groups. Like they had a lot of groups early on, then they squeezed them all together for a while, and then they broke up again and broke up again. Um, Allah says in Surah Al-Anam, uh, He says, Indeed, you, O Prophet, are not responsible whatsoever for those who've divided their faith and split into sects. Their judgment rests only with Allah, and He will inform them of what they used to do. And Allah says in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah this religion of yours is the only one, and I am your Lord, so fear me alone. Yet, still, the people have divided into different sects, each rejoicing in what they have. Right? So, Allah's talking about this is how people are. We always like to break up. And so, you know, the goal is to, to have that unity, but, you know, easier said than done. Um, then finally, for practices, uh, for Islam, you know, we have our five pillars. We have shahada, salah, zakah, sayyam, and hajj. Um, for Christians, they do things like they have baptism. That's how somebody becomes a Christian. Um, some churches, like the Catholics and the Orthodox, they baptize them as babies. So, what's their... They're born, they give them a little bit of time, and they baptize them. For Protestants, some of them do it as babies. Some of them have you choose to be baptized once you're old enough, like a teenager or an adult. Um, just kind of dif difference of opinion on that. But that is how somebody, so they dunk you in water, or now to make it easy, sometimes they just sprinkle water on your head, and then they have you, like they, they say, now you're part of the faith. Right? Uh, communion is where they eat bread and drink wine, or Protestants sometimes do grape juice because they think alcohol is bad, which we have as haram, so we're, we agree with them on that, but they'll do bread and, and grape juice and they're doing symbolic going into communion with Jesus. They say this is Jesus' body, symbolic, and this is his blood, symbolic, and so they eat that, and that's supposed to be a recreation of the Last Supper, 
So when Jesus, before he was going to be crucified in the Bible, he has all his disciples together and he tells them, this bread is symbolic. Like, this is my body. It will be broken for you all. And he said, this is my blood. This wine is symbolic. This will be shed for everyone. And so then they all share in it. And so like by taking community, they're, they're coming under that safety of his sacrifice covering them. Right? I mean, if you go to a Catholic church, they do it every single service. Like every time they go, they do this. So the priest gets out these little circles of bread and he has this wine and everybody lines up and they go take a piece and they take a drink. Um, Protestants might only do it like Easter time. When I, was, when I was a Christian, we would only do it on Easter time because that's when he, they say he got sacrificed. So they try to do it then to commemorate it. Um, I think Orthodox do it every time too. Um, I need to study Orthodoxy more. Maybe. Um, they do fasting, but they don't do fasting like we do. Um, they have a month, uh, not a month, they have 40 days called Lent, and then they also fast outside of that. But during that time, they do some form of abstention. So a lot of Protestants and Catholics, they would give up something they love for 40 days. So they might say, okay, I really love, I don't know, uh, ice cream. So they say, I'm not going to eat ice cream for the 40 days uh, to show devotion to God, right? Also, Catholics would not eat meat on Fridays. That was part of their fasting. So every Friday they would have to eat fish during Lent. They could have fish but, or vegetables. Um, for the Orthodox, they have more serious fasting. They usually go vegetarian the whole time of Lent. So they won't eat any meat during that time. And they'll try to only do two meals a day. Um, they also do a lot of hymns. If you ever go to a church service, which you know, there's issues with that as a Muslim, but uh, people like to sing, so they'll get out these hymnals and they'll stand up and they'll sing songs kind of together in solidarity. Um, and then they do prayer, but their prayer is du'a, that we call du'a, that's their form of prayer. Although some places like the Catholics, they will have them get on their knees to make du'a. So they'll get on their knees and kneel while they're making du'a. Okay, that's, that's the end of the presentation. Any questions? <laughs> Was it too thorough? I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um. I'm not too familiar with like Lent and stuff, but I, I have like had friends at school that didn't eat meat on Fridays and things right. like that. And I never really understood why. Is there like kind of like a reason behind it or? Um, I, I don't know why the abstention from meat. I mean, for them, it's, it's a form of fasting, I guess. But um, I think there's some research that early Christians were, I don't know if it was due to poverty or they were kind of, Staying away from meat, it might be, honestly, because it wasn't like halal, right? It wasn't the biha. They were in the Roman Empire. Everything slaughtered for an idol. And so I think a solution for them was to not eat any meat or to only eat fish. Because even for us, fish is never an issue, right? But regardless of how strict you are, right? Like usually for Muslims, like the Arabs aren't as strict. It's like the Indo-Pax or whatever with the halal meat and all that. But uh, for the... Uh, for the Christians, that's my theory, is that they couldn't find any meat, really, that's halal for them, so they have to abstain from it. And so over time, it's been 2,000 years, that kind of just became traditional, um, you know. But uh, originally, they were even, even Paul, though Paul, for the Christians, basically, he's telling them, you don't have to worry about all the laws that, that we had before. But he did still tell them, don't eat any meat that's slaughtered for an idol, right? And so in the Roman Empire, that's kind of all you're stuck with, so... I think it has some roots with that, maybe, um, giving them kind of a benefit of the doubt, but I don't know for sure to say, like, this is the reason exactly. Now, do they, like us, have, like, like kind of, you know how we have, like, the halal, like, you, we want to try to eat halal meat. Do they somewhat have something similar to that, I'm guessing? Not, not really anymore. I mean, if they look at their book, the only thing Paul is telling them is don't eat anything that was slaughtered for... No. An idol or anything that you found dead already, kind of they have that aspect. But they're able to eat pork. Christians eat pork. Um, you know, they don't really have any limits on types of animals. They believe, in a way, they're saying that Jesus dying for the sins makes them free from having to obey the law. Um, that's all really coming from Paul, too, where Paul is teaching them that the law was something for us because, you know, we were kind of, we needed it. and But now... You've been freed from that, you know, you've graduated. And so, you know, now you just, you have your faith there and you're believing Jesus died for you. And so the law is not a big deal. They do have a, a thing of keeping the Ten Commandments. 
Um, but even that, they don't do the Sabbath. So, um, you know. <laughs> but they have the, they've had a little, much lightning, and they really kind of threw the Sharia out for them. You know that? Because I know I, when I remember talking to people, they regard like all sins as kind of like the same. So like the yeah. sin of killing someone is the same as let's say I said. I called someone a bad word or something. Like yeah, that, that is a, that is for some Christians that is their teaching. They yeah. say sin is equally bad. That's why you need Jesus to die for you, because they're all keeping you to hell. They all put you in hellfire no matter what. So you need somebody to take that for you, right? Take the punishment. They said when he got crucified, he was taking the punishment that everybody's supposed to get for their sins. They say because everybody is going to sin, right? Whether it's little things or big things, they say. You know, it all would put you in hell or whatever. But that's not what the whole Jewish part of the Bible is teaching them. It's not teaching that at all. When the Jews get punished in the Old Testament, it's always really once they start doing shirk and start abusing their own people with murder and oppression and, you know, adultery and this major, major sins, that's when God lets them be conquered, right? When they do little stuff, he doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't you know, he's giving them a chance to make tovah and all that, right? But once they do shirk, then he's like, I'll let these armies conquer you because you have abandoned me for these idols. Right? And for us, we know that's the biggest sin you could do. Because we see sins as they're heavier by the damage they do and by how wrong it was that you wronged that one that you wronged. So it's hard to word that right. But like, for example, if you hurt your mom, that's worse than if you hurt your neighbor. Right? But both are bad. But because you owe more to your mom, the sin becomes greater, right? That's why shirk is the worst thing you can do because we owe the most to Allah. We can't do anything to Allah. We can't hurt him or anything like that. But what we're doing is we're taking his right away to be worshipped and we're giving it to something else. And so that why, that's why shirk is the worst thing you can do. That's why we worry about the Christians because even if they're really nice and they're giving sadaqah and they're so, you know, good to you, and not, they're doing shirk, most of them. So always, because they'll, they'll always hear that, like they'll say, okay, well, this person is so nice to everybody, they just do shirk. How come they might go to hellfire? And it's like, okay, but who, who decides who goes to hellfire or not? The one you are wronging is the one that's making that decision. You know? So you don't think, like, that should, that should make you reflect, you know? The, like, it's, it's not just, you know, you wrong some guy and he has nothing to do with you. It's like, you're wronging the one that's going to decide where you go. Right? And you're doing the worst wrong because you owe him your very existence. You owe him everything. And then you're going to give the right that you owe him for that to somebody else. So believing in like the Trinity, would that be considered shirk? Definitely. And that's why Allah calls it out in the Quran, right? He says, don't say Trinity. Um, yeah. Because what you're doing is you're making these two beings equal to Allah. So what, what they're really doing is the Father is, what they're talking about is Allah. The son is Isa, Ibn Maryam, Jesus, peace be him. The Holy Spirit is Jibril, Isa. They just don't know what it is because when they call him in the Bible Holy Spirit, they don't know that's talking about the angel that's bringing revelation. They just say the Holy Spirit is supporting the prophets. The Holy Spirit inspired these people to know what to say. So they, is that the Trinity? That's what they call the Trinity? Yeah, that's the Trinity. So they say, you know, yeah, they, they, they have the Father is Allah, but then they, they make Isa equal to him. They make Jibril equal to him. And they say all three of these are divine persons and they they really they don't like to think about it because it breaks down into problems because the only way it can still be one god is either these three are parts of one god right or they're different forms of god but both of those are rejected by christianity they say you cannot say it's parts you cannot say god turns into these different forms they say these three are divine beings and they're all together sharing in the essence of the one god that's essential. Like, but he says parts. It's still parts, yeah. right? That's what I'm saying. It's either partial or modal. Like he switches, you know, I turn into this one, then I turn into this one, you know. So that's why they, I can't remember. I, I've never ever argued with a Christian. I have a lot. We get missionaries come to the mission all the time, and they would like to practice on us. Right? They would come and they would like, well, God is like an egg, right? So you have a shell, and you have a yolk, and you have a white, and all that's one egg. But you're like, no, those are parts of an egg. If I break the egg and I just have a shell, would anybody accept that? I say, oh, you want me to make you egg? Here's a shell. That's egg. If it's not egg, that's a shell, man. That's part. I want the egg, you know. So those things that it doesn't work, you know. And there were Christian groups that early on they didn't accept that, right? But they eventually they got oppressed and pushed out. 
If you guys ever listen to the story of Salman al-Farisi, right, the Sahabi, he discovered Christianity in Persia, and it was a branch that was not Trinity. And so he's asking them, where can I learn more about this? And the guy says, you got to go to Sham, because that's where it came from. So he travels to Sham, and he finds some different churches. He goes to one, he finds a guy, no, no Trinity, he's just Tawheed Christianity, right? But that guy's super old, and he tells him, he tells Salman, he says, I'm about to die. I only know like one other guy who's doing my kind of Christianity. Everybody else has become Romanized, become Trinity. So he says, go to that one. So he goes to that church and he studies with him till that guy dies. And then that guy's about to die. He says, I only know one guy left who's on our kind of Christianity. He says, go to him. So he goes to him and that guy says, I don't know anybody left on the earth who's doing it right. He says, but now the prophet is supposed to come. Here are the signs. He said, go live for him in the land of palm trees, which was Medina. Right, so Salman goes there and he finds the Prophet. Right? So even historically, you can see that early on Christianity has like, you have the Jerusalem branch, which is Jesus' followers, then you have Paul, who's spreading it all through the Roman Empire, his branch. Right? And then the Romans have a lot more support because it's the Roman Empire. You guys know historically, the Roman Empire, nobody can match them. So when they adopt Christianity, they smash everybody, that all the other groups get pushed to the sides, they get kicked out to Arabia, get kicked out to to Persia, like some man's teacher, you know, they, they get marginalized. And so what becomes the mainstream Christianity is that Trinitarian uh, type. And the Romans were ready to do that because they had concepts of God having sons. They had Zeus, Poseidon, and, and Hades are these three brothers, and they run the whole creation, right? So they're already kind of prepared to, uh, they bring their ideas into that, right? So they mix what Asa taught with what they already had in Rome, and it becomes Christianity. Even historically, you have a lot of books. There's a good book by, I mean, you guys heard of Bart Ehrman, but he has a book said, uh, it's a book called How Jesus Became God. And he goes through the history and how he got slowly and slowly, they start making him higher, higher level, higher, higher level, and until they start making him equal with, with God. And that's what they have the council in the 300s called the Council of Nicaea. They had a big council to decide what is Asa's status. Is he equal with God? Is he less than God? Because everybody's arguing about it. The biggest church at that time was the Aryan church. They said, he's not a regular human, but he's not equal to God. All right? They said he's subordinate, like a, almost like a demigod, but they said you cannot make him equal. Right? You're going against the whole Bible if you make him equal. Even you're going against what Jesus himself says, because he says stuff in the Bible like, the Father is greater than I. Right? So, like, how can you make them equal? But then they didn't like that because they love Jesus so much they want him to be equal. You know, so they... They have that where they exonerate him or elevate him. That's what the Prophet said, he used to tell the Zahaba. He says, don't overpraise me like they did with Asa. Like, don't turn me into something equal, you know. Uh, 